Okay, is everybody here? I think we can start. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself for a second and then I'll empty. Great, I have successfully muted YouTube. Um, Do options side by side, check that. Okay, that'll work hopefully. Yaren will work on that as I introduce. Uh, what's going on? For those of you who are watching from uh, YouTube, thanks for joining us. Uh, the lecture is uh, being presented by Yaren Kim and Rose Wallman on how do you listen chamber music tips. Uh, if you are coming from, are you? If you're watching on YouTube, please uh, message us if you have any questions, and we will get to them if we have time. And I will be sending them in. Uh, from YouTube to Zoom so that the presenters can um, can read them and answer anything that you might have uh, in terms of uh, what you think is uh, a, a good question for what's going on in the lecture. Um, other than that, um, yeah, we hope you enjoy. And I will now turn it over to Yaren and Rose. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Yaren. I think you, the festival folks, we've all met by now. It's just, we're on day two. Uh, it's amazing. It's already second day, and it's everything is so much smoother. I heard a lot more people today. It was great fun. Um, we were dancing around. We did a lot of conducting, playing together. It, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Um, so today I'm going to be giving a co lecture with Rose. Um, I'll go first because I had a little game and exercise that I wanted to play with all of you. So if you don't already have it, please go grab um, a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen, whatever that you prefer. Um, and if you're watching this from YouTube, please feel free to join. It's just a simple, simple game that I would like to play because I think it, it shows a lot about how we approach chamber music. Um, so this is what I'm going to do. I prepare for this. I even divided all you guys into groups. So we have, if you're in Vivaldi group, for all of you guys in the festival, if you're in Vivaldi and Dvorak, you're in one group. And then if you're in Shostakovich and Beethoven, you're in the other. Um, I know Maya. Maya, you're in Vivaldi and Beethoven, right? So why don't Maya, you go to Beethoven? That would kind of even out the numbers a bit. So again, Vivaldi and Dvorak, one group. If you're in Shostakovich, Beethoven, you're in the other group. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read a short poem for everybody. And you guys all have um, a, a job to do. Is somebody waiting in the waiting room? Okay, no. You guys all have a job to do. Uh, so you're going to listen. And you're going to listen for two things. Listen for the rhyming words that I assigned each group. And then the other one is figuring out the rhythm of this poem. Okay. So I want Vivaldi and Dvorak group to listen for two separate rhymes. The first one being all. Count all the count all the words that end or you know have the rhyming all in it. And the other one would be and, you know, hand, grand, whatever that ends with and. So for Vivaldi and Dvorak, again, it'll be all and and. For the other group, Shostakovich and Beethoven, listen for I, I sound and and, uh, no, 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 wrong, wrong. <laughs> ain't, rain or like remain, ain, that kind of sound. So we will be listening to ain and I. So each group has two things to listen for, right? That's the rhymes. And the other rhythm one is figuring out, is it in duple or triple? In other words, you know, Poems that are in duple, basically in two. Roses are red, violets are blue. That's in two. If it's in three, roses are red and yellow, not as fine as you. Violets are cool. You know, it's that's all in three. <laughs> I know, right? I should go into poetry. Rose is laughing at me. I should have chosen a poetry as my profession. So yeah, so I want you to figure out the, the poem that I'm reading is in two or three. And then the other one is the rhyming. Okay, so is everybody ready? Here we go. I'll read it once. Maybe I'll read it twice. It's pretty short. Here we go. 
I am taller than tall. I'm the tallest of all. The mammal that live on the land. I can nibble in the leaves from the tip tops of trees. I think being tallest is grand. My head is so high that it touches the sky. I can wink at the birds as they go flying by. I can nuzzle the clouds, feel the first drops of rain, enjoy the fine view from this lofty domain. With my head at this height, the whole world is in height. I think being tallest is grand. Should we hear it one more time? Here we go. I am taller than tall. I am tallest of all, the mammal that lives on the land. I can nibble the leaves from the tip top of trees. I think being tallest is grand. My head is so high that it touches the sky. I can wink at the birds as they go flying by. I can nuzzle the clouds, feel the first drops of rain, enjoy the fine view from this lofty domain. With my head at this height, the whole world is in sight. I think being tallest is grand. Okay, I'm gonna change to gallery view so I can see everybody with this. All right, so Vivaldi group. Just raise your hand if you are really confident that you know the answer. How many total, because I gave you guys each two things to listen for, add them up. How many rhyming things did you hear? You can just do whatever. Ella did four, five. Hannah, four. Yeah. Ray, did you hear anything? Jarek says four, five. Okay, a few answers here and there. Okay, what about the Shasi Beethoven group? How many did you hear total? Maya, five or four? Bakke, five. Matt, four, five or three, somewhere there. Jude, one. <laughs> Good. Okay, so we have different numbers. What about the rhythms? Was it in two or was it in three? Or was it in like five? <laughs> Maya, what did you think? We're like doing sign language. I can't see. I think you're trying to say five. Um, okay, so, oh, one, two, three, good, good. Okay, so here's the answer. Let's go from the rhythm. It was in two and some long ones in four, right? Because it was, I'm tall as a tree, as high as can be. One, two, one, two. So that's sort of like how we talk about pulse in, in groups, right? We give each other tempo, but we say, okay, it's in two or it's in three, you know? So that's what I wanted you to all listen for rhythms. Okay, rhymes. To be honest, I actually don't know the answer because I didn't go through and count it all. Um, but you guys are probably all right and wrong. I don't know. But the important is who knows what this poem is about? Maya, you can unmute yourself. Being tall is awesome. Being tall is awesome. <laughs> What do you think the poem is describing? Oh, that. Ella? A, point of... a giraffe. A giraffe, <laughs> yes. Jude, what were you going to say? A giraffe. giraffe. Yeah. Did everybody get that? I see some nods. Yeah. Okay, so listening to all these rhymings and rhythms, did that help or not help trying to figure out what this poem was about? I see some faces, yes and no. Okay, I'll give you the correct answer. The correct answer is no. <laughs> 
the point is, see, that's that's what it is. There's so many little jobs we need to do in chamber music, right? You have a trio, you have a quartet, sometimes a quintet, sextet, you know, bigger chamber works. Everybody has jobs that they're in charge of, you know. We have the bass lines giving us a constant pulse. Chalice, you guys are probably usually the heartbeat of our group, you know. And we have the violinists who have this lyrical voice, singing lines, violas, the inner voice going, you know, up and down and waves of sound. Pianists, a lot of times we kind of just have to do everything. Um, there's, so we have a lot of jobs that we share, but it's really important that we don't lose the big picture of it. Just kind of like how we listen to a poem. And if I give you a specific job, like what I just did, listen for all the rhyming words, figure out the tempo, figure out the rhythms. It's really easy to get stuck on that specific jobs that we have. Um, but the, at the end of the day, you're supposed to figure out um, what the, the poem is about here. I'll change it to speakable. Um, do you see what I mean? So the whole idea of this exercise was to show you that's, I think it's really important to keep that in mind in chamber music especially when we are practicing by ourselves, we're learning our notes, we're learning our parts, and we come together to rehearse. And you're making all those little small jobs and put them together to create what the piece is about. You know, in this case, it was about giraffes. So we, we need to figure out the whole big picture. And I think that's, that comes down to what the chamber music experience is about, you know? So very first thing, before you even start, rehearsals or anything, you need to know your part inside out. That's, I guess, number one thing. As a pianist, you need to know your part and the other people's part, you know? Um, pianists, we always start and learn from the full score. And I know everybody in this festival I gave you and really emphasize in your coachings, always have your full score ready. And that's for that reason. Um, even if you aren't used to playing, you know, from the full score, string players, you should know and learn how to play from full scores at all times, because that has so many information that you can kind of just go to and immediately it's there for you, not only visually, but you, when you see you're playing, let's say if you're a violinist, and if you see a violist playing the same responding melody line, a measure away from you, you should be able to imagine that sound by just seeing the visual um, layout from the score. So that's really important. That's, I think, number one step of trying to be uh, more open-minded, having your ears open. Um, and also it helps with your communication, you know. Another thing that's really important about chamber music and communicating, we're doing it in a very different way with this festival. You know, we play for each other and we comment, um, but it's not too different when it comes to rehearsals because you're just voicing what you hear in your own words, right? So, I mean, to give you an example, Brendan and I met al almost 15 years ago. Is that right? I can't remember. We met in college um, and that's a long time to know somebody. And so you'd think that our rehearsals would be super easy, right? Like I know him, he knows me. It should be so easy. Like I would just have to kind of be like, hey, and he should be able to know what I mean. It's quite the opposite. We are such different people. We communicate so differently. Our personalities are so different that we can go into like heated arguments for hours about one phrase that it would have been so much easier if we just played for each other without just talking. You know, um, the biggest musical argument that I got in with Brendan, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this, we were playing, I don't remember what piece it was, but we were playing something and I said, hey, uh, that phrase, I see it. I hear it as four bar phrase. Can we try that again? And Brendan, without even kind of thinking, he's like, oh, I don't think in numbers. I think in music. <laughs> now, can you imagine how angry I would have been hearing that, right? <laughs> So that's, that was the end of that rehearsal. I think we needed like a, a day break. But when we went back to it, Brendan and I wanted the same thing. You know, I just have a, when I talk about things, I need to visualize it. So for me, it's a four bar phrase. For Brendan, it made it sense to just play it and show what the phrasing marquee was. Um, but if we had agreed, 
okay, if we look at the score, the reason why it didn't match up was because when he starts his four bar phrase is different from when I start my four bar phrase. So if we were kind of had a big general idea visually and understanding of the piece, it would have saved us a lot of time. It would have saved us an argument. It would have saved us a lot of energy trying to argue about this one thing that we want you know, together. So my biggest thing for you guys, because there are a lot of string players here and pianists too. And I think it's your job as pianists to let them know because you're usually the one with the whole score in front of you. Um, you kind of have to conduct the whole rehearsal a little bit. Yeah, you know, if the violin is here, second violin comes here, viola, you kind of have to let them organize. You can, you're the organized brain because you have the whole score and you, you are, we are more used to doing that. But it doesn't mean that string players shouldn't try and only rely on the pianist or the conductor. I think the number one thing that I have learned through the years is that it makes a big difference when you play with string players who know the whole piece, not just their parts, but like your second violinist part, your viola part, your cello part, piano part. So go through the whole piece, listen to it with the score, listen to it. I mean, this festival is really encouraging you to listen to each other a lot more than you're used to probably. And it's also encouraging you to listen and read the full score a lot more than you're used to. So that's all really great um, skill set to have, right? So that's two very important things that I think is most important for me um, of, you know, being a chamber musician um, is knowing your job, the little jobs that you have, um, but also knowing the big picture, which leads to seeing the big visualized music in front of you using the whole score. Um, and I mean, I honestly didn't start chamber music seriously until I went to college. And to be honest, that's kind of late. You know, you guys are all very lucky that you have chamber groups and you get to play these amazing repertoire of music and chamber music. Um, especially for pianists, we're always by ourselves. You know, we're in our room practicing in our own instrument. We don't even join the orchestra. Um, I so des desperately wanted to join a choir. And I joke that when I retire, I want to be the, what is this, mallet? The, the percussion person so that I can join the uh, community orchestra or wherever I'm living and play the mauler, just sit there, enjoy in that big groove. And when it's my turn, just come in and bang on it. it that's, that seems so fun, you know? So take this opportunity to really soak yourself into chamber music repertoire and just listen. And pianists, this is actually specific for you guys, pianists, um, you have to have your ear open at all times, which means that you have to be really secure with your part inside out and you have to listen. It's like basically your left hand is your cellist. Your thumbs are your violist and second violinist. Your pinky and fourth finger sometimes are the, uh, the strings. So you have the whole string quartet in your hands and your ears has to be the orchestra. So it's just like expanding your capabilities of listening. And I can't emphasize that more. Just not be so soaked in your own part that you have no idea what's going on. And you know, I was really happy. Everybody I've heard so far have been really good when they're not together with the rehearsal videos. <laughs> Sometimes I, when I coach in real life, people get off and they don't know when, when or why it happened. But in this kind of setting where you're really encouraged to listen, you guys are doing a really good job of knowing, oh, we got off at, you know, rehearsal one because I didn't hear that downbeat there, which is great. That's already a huge win for me. So keep listening to that. Um, and I think Rose will talk more about on this because it also helps to know it's in line with what your job is, but it also helps to know who to listen for, who the leader is. You know, if your job at this passage is, oh, I'm providing harmony. We just worked on the Dvorak Quintet with Rachel. Um, there's a sections when the violists have such beautiful lines and pianists are supposed to create this blanket of colors, different temperatures with the pulse that the cellist is giving. So you have, Rachel, you have two, uh, two jobs there, um, but you have to follow what the violist is doing, the, the breathing that she gives. 
but you can't go away too much that the violist is like, oh, wait, where, where did my heartbeat go? You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's a fine balance between who's leading, who's following. And that's something that's also really important. And I, I think cellists, violinists, string players in general, you guys have a lot of training in that because, you know, you're in orchestras, you're in string quartets, and a lot of this chamber music skills go beyond just playing um, your instruments. So I'll hand it over to uh, Rose because I think she can talk more about the string perspective um, on how to lead and how to respond. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just want to say it one more time for the string players in the back. Know your scores. <laughs> come to every rehearsal with a score and have studied your score before you come to rehearsal. <laughs> Very. This is like extremely important for, for anything, but particularly for chamber music where we don't have a conductor and it's on us, right? To craft the performance. Um, so I'd like to talk about two different aspects of, of chamber music playing. And I'm a violist, I'm a string player. So some of this is a little more pertinent to string players than to pianists, but I think everybody can, can benefit from, from thinking about these things. Um, so the first one is sound and like how to create a group sound. Um, and so if you think of your group as like a pyramid, right? It's fat on the bottom. It's got its nice, like big foundation. And as it goes up, it gets skinnier, right? It gets like pointier so that everything, it's a really solid foundation, right? It's a solid structure. Like you're not gonna go over to a pyramid and like knock it over easily. Um, and that's really how you want to create your group sound. Um, and so what this means, um, you know, practically and, and technically is that like for us, our cellists and left hand of the piano, right? You guys are the bottom of our pyramid. It's up to you to create a sound that everybody else can then stack on top of that, that creates a stable structure. Um, and so... So low instruments, you know, when you're when you're creating your sound, when you're playing your part, um, you need to have a sound that, for one thing, like serves serves the music, right? If you're playing something that's you know whispery and pianissimo, you don't want to be playing with this kind of like Brahmsian thick, juicy sound, right? Because that's not the aesthetic that we're going for. But you also don't want to be so wispy and pianissimo that then the violist can barely play. And by the time you get to the first violinist, they're just like air bowing because they can't fit themselves on top of on top of your pyramid. Right. Um, so cellists, um, it's really important for you to think of yourselves as the base of of this structure and create a sound that the other instruments can then put their sounds into or stack their sounds on top of um, sort of whatever whatever image works best for you, right? Like nesting bowls or, or a pyramid, um, sort of whatever, whatever works for you. Um, middle instruments. I feel like, I mean, I'm a violist, so I, I know the struggles personally. Um, but I feel like our job in a way is even a little bit harder because it's easy to create too small a sound, right? If our cellist gives us this and we give this, we're like, oh, you know, we're like stacked on top of our cello sound. We sound great, we're perfect. But then the poor violinist has to give us this, right? And, and the violinist wants to, wants to play out and wants to, um, you know, play their, their melody, which they, you know, they have most of the time. Um, and so it's our job, if the cellist gives us this, we want to give this, right? So sort of the most that you can give while still creating this stable structure and matching, you know, contact point, bow speed, um, amount, not, amount of air in the sound or, you know, amount of core in the sound, that kind of thing. Um, so to create our next layer of the pyramid in a way that, we're, that we don't have a big bump in the structure, right? So that whoever's on top of us can continue to stack. Um, and then upper instruments, 
you know, for like first violin who almost always has the melody, you you want to feel like you can play out and play beautifully and really, you know, sing sing your part the way you want to. But it's your job to always listen down, right? Always listen to what's below you. Because if you put your sound inside the sound that's already created, it's going to it's going to make this beautiful whole that is, you know, unified and um, it's, it's going to help you um, play in a way that, uh, that the whole thing sounds like one ensemble rather than a number of, of different people. Um, and so I feel like that's, that's one of the hardest things is to really teach yourself to listen to what's below you because that's it's so easy to to listen to what's above right it's it's so easy to listen to the melody if you're you know if you're listening to music on you know what whatever you listen to in your spare time right what jumps out at you it's the melody um and it's and it's often the highest voice and so as performers it's our job to sort of circumvent that and and really listen really listen down rather than listen to what's the highest um the other thing that this is sort of a magic trick for is intonation and i know that brendan is going to talk about intonation tomorrow the next day tomorrow um but you'd be surprised how much um balance of your ensemble affects intonation and just to sort of highlight this point, I'm going to play a little um, example. So I've got a C major chord here. This is on GarageBand. This is like the string MIDI sound <laughs> on GarageBand. So like the intonation isn't going to change. The sound quality isn't going to change. The um, sound density and that kind of thing isn't going to change. The only thing I'm going to change is the volume of the different notes. So hopefully you can hear this. Um, so this is the this is our chord. Everybody at the exact same volume. Can you guys hear that? Yeah. Okay. Good. Sounds good, right? C major chord. So what happens if I take our pyramid and like? completely flip it over, right? So I'm gonna bump the, the top note way up. I'm gonna knock the bass down a lot. Like it still sounds okay, but it's not, it's not as good as it was, right? So now I'm going to knock the middle and the bass way down, and we just have the violinist being a diva. And now I'm going to create our pyramid. So with no other variables changing aside from um, dynamic, it's kind of amazing how much it changes your perception of, of the chord, right? Like this last one, it's got this nice big bass that the others then kind of, kind of fit inside, right? And like the intonation sounds better, the chord sounds like it's ringing more sounds to me like there's more overtones and all this kind of stuff, even though it's just a MIDI file, right? And everything and everything is the same. And every time you, you change the balance so that you're not stacking things up from biggest to smallest, it kind of changes your perception of, of the sound. 
Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is ensemble, and I realize that I'm running out of time. Um, and I want to talk mostly about leading and following in a in a chamber ensemble. So let me just quickly ask you guys, what does a leader do? Like, what's what's the job of a leader? And go ahead and just unmute yourself and like throw ideas out. A leader um, controls everyone that is in the same thing with them. So they kind of like tell you how to like the pace of the music and and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No. The leader helps maintain a consistent framework within the music, and I don't know kind of helps delegate when things are supposed to happen. Okay. Any other ideas about what a leader does? The leader of a chamber music group? I think Peter Pan said it the best. Is it following the leader, leader, the leader, following the leader wherever he may go? We've been watching way too many Disney movies. <laughs> That's my take on leader. <laughs> yeah. A good leader delegates. A <laughs> good leader delegates, yeah. Nice. Um, so, so a leader in a chamber group, like often they'll give the cue, right? They'll like start the piece and, and maybe end the piece, right? Like show you when to cut off a note. If there's a tempo change or something, they'll, they'll sort of be in charge of like showing the group the pacing of it or how it's going to go, that kind of thing. Right? And so if we have leaders, then obviously we have followers, right? So what's the followers job? To, fo to follow, um, to do the same exact thing as the leader, but um, in a different way and follow their piece how the leader is following his or hers. Yeah, that's well put, good. Anything else? What a follower's job is? To know what they're doing, remain consistent, and respond to the cues and changes that the leader gives. <laughs> good, yeah, right. So a follower, like a, a follower's job is to, is, is to, like do do as well as they can to create the leader's kind of vision of the of the piece right and so i i actually really hate these terms follower and leader like i think they're very um i think they're they're just not i think they're very deceptive um in terms of what is actually required from the quote unquote leader or the quote unquote follower so in my view, the leader, um, the leader's job is to show what he or she wants. But then after the leader has done this, the leader's job is to play together with the rest of the ensemble. So like, if I'm the leader, I give a big cue, I think I've been super clear, and I come in a split second before everybody else, that means that I haven't done a good job as a leader. That means that I have either not given my cue properly, right? Not, not cued what I thought I cued, or I'm just playing ahead of, of my cue, right? Like I'm not following my cue properly. Um, and so what that tells me is that I need to change something about what I'm doing, right? Because if I give a cue, everybody else comes in here and I come in here, that means that everybody else is interpreting my cue one way. And I, I think that I'm doing something that I'm not. And then, so, so a leader kind of leads and then follows, right? A follower, quote unquote follower, has to be a mind reader. And to be a follower, like, 
follower is a word that I particularly hate because if you follow someone, you're behind them, right? But to be a follower in chamber music, if you're behind, you're behind. Like you're, it's not good ensemble. And so um, a follower in a way has to be a mind reader and you need kind of nerves of steel because you need to look at what the leader is doing, decide what you, oh yeah, Brendan says or a ninja. <laughs> you need to be a ninja if you're a follower. Um, you need to look at what the leader is giving you and then decide what you think that means and do it. And you can't wait until you've heard what the leader does because by then it's too late. So you have to trust that you are interpreting what the leader is giving you correctly and just go for it. And the rehearsal process is, oh, that didn't work at all. I totally mis misunderstood what you were trying to say. Leader, I'm so sorry. Let's try that again. <laughs> or leader, I need X, Y, Z from you because I'm not getting what you're trying to tell me. Um, so all of that is part of the rehearsal process. But the terms leader and follower, so like the leader leads, but then it's their job to play with everybody else, right? The follower follows, but then it's their job to like be extremely proactive about playing what you think the, re the leader wants. And, you know, I say, I say leader and follower, like these are kind of concrete things, but these, these roles switch around all the time, right? Like just because your first violinist cues the piece at the beginning doesn't mean that, you know, two sixteenth notes later, it's actually the second violinist who's leading, right? Or the cellist who's leading. Um, so these are not like badges that you wear, right? These are roles that, that move around. Um, so, you know, in, in rehearsal, like, like for me, this is what rehearsal is about, right? It's sort of learning how to communicate with each other to the point where you're, you're kind of reading each other's minds, right? And, and if somebody's leading and the other person is following, then it's not good chamber music, right? You're not actually playing all that well together. It's more that everybody is learning to lead and to follow at the same time. And everybody is doing kind of both of these things actively at the same time. And even, and I, and I feel like this is particularly pertinent for like violists, um, you know, second, vi second violinists, inner voices, people who, who are often only considered followers, like unless you have the tune, which, you know, depending on the repertoire is rare. Um, you know, we, we as like followers really need to remember that it's our job to do what we think is right, right? So you, you look at what's going on and you think, this is what needs to happen here. I'm going to do it. If it's wrong, that's why we rehearse, right? And I think that that's a, that's a mentality that we get, we get kind of scared of, right? It's like, oh God, what if I play my note in the wrong place? But that's what the rehearsal process is. Right. And if you don't ever play your note in the wrong place, you're always going to be you're, you're never going to find the right place. Um, so that's yeah, I mean, for me, for me, this whole thing about leading and following, that's the most important thing about learning to play chamber music well. And so I think, you know, especially especially as, as string players, because we get kind of relegated to two different roles um, that it's difficult to to sort of get yourself out of that mentality right the leader mentality or the and particularly the follower mentality um, so just know that you know when you're rehearsing chamber music with your friends a leader is only leading like basically the leader is only leading until you start playing right and then everybody is leading together um, and I think that 
that kind of courage is really the best thing that you can bring to your chamber group. I would, um, I would love to add to what Rose was just saying. Um, you know, there are ways that you can make yourself a little bit more confident with that role change of going back between leader and follower is that there are things that we all, if you're in a group together, there is one fundamental thing that we all share, regardless of whether you're following or leading. Um, and for me, that's pulse. Everybody in that music, that piece of music that you're playing, we all share this, this basic musical heartbeat. So, I mean, what's the, I mean, I'll ask you guys, everybody's listening, our, our festival people, like what's the difference between pulse and tempo? Because there is a difference. Any ideas of what a pulse and a tempo difference might be? Crickets? Um, a piece can be in like three, four or something. And the tempo might be, I don't know, if it's really fast, like 180 BPM or something. Each each beat in the measure is 180 um, beats, like beats per minute. But if you can feel it in one and that would be the pulse. So it would be like the pulse would be every three beats and the tempo wouldn't be equal to the pulse in that case. Exactly, exactly. So you can quantify a tempo. You know, when we first gave you guys the assignments and the scores and the rehearsal videos, we provided you with the tempo markings. We said, okay, Beethoven trio, it's in this tempo. Um, the Lavignac eight piece, it's quite complicated to put every four pianists together. So this is the tempo, 150. Um, but I'm pretty sure you probably had experienced this. Everybody it could be playing in the same exact tempo, but then you try playing with each other and then you just don't match up. You know, there are cases when you guys are exactly with the metronome, but something just doesn't sound right. And a lot of times it's because your pulse aren't matching. You know, you, you kind of have to, and that's that's also something that you can do in rehearsals. You have to figure out what um, what that section requires for that group pulse to be. You know, for a short example, like the Beethoven, I think Maya, um, Ananya, and Matthew are playing that, right? It's like the opening, it's a slow, it's Adagio Cantabile, so... You know, it's in 3-4, but if I gave myself a pulse that's divided into every beat, it sounds like... Same tempo, let's spread that pulse much further. was one breath and it's hard to do because it's such a slow piece but if you have that kind of in your system before you guys come in the string players then you know exactly where that downbeat pulse is not downbeat tempo that's the big difference because a lot of times when string players come in you a lot of have you a lot of times you guys have the upbeat you know the violins have to go yum bum bum and that second note um bum if you don't think about the downbeat as the main pulse, it's easy to go bum, 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 bum. Then that's when you replay the same tempo but with a different pulse. And that's when the music doesn't quite fit right. So that's something, again, it all ties into what Rose was saying and what I was saying. Listen and study the full score. Listen with your heart, with your eyes, your ears, nose, mouth, every senses everything you just have to be listening like a mad person yeah um we are running out of time so uh, do we have any questions about like what you've learned so far trying this new chamber music or what you have learned before this no i, I think <clears throat> if i could just add one thing um that i hope maybe the students could think about you know, uh, so much of what we're doing, which is unusual, 
uh, in chamber music is that we're not getting on your case about your dynamics, which is great for us because I feel like I spend a lot of time talking about, you know, violence playing too loud, violas playing too soft, cellists on the wrong measure, whatever. Um, and what I'd like to confirm, though, for those of you who are probably thinking this way anyways, even if we have someone as brilliant as Daniel messing with your decibel level later, you can't fix your phrase. So make sure that when you're thinking about intonation and listening, that you're actively responding to your partners who are pre-recorded, um, because that can't be altered as successfully, really, to think about playing as if you were playing with real people. Yeah, Daniel won't put a phrasing in for you. <laughs> that, that would have to be your job. I mean, true, true is uh, there is very little that you can do to to adjust intention because it's it is a combination. Volume is a, is, is a combination of things uh, that include um, the amplitude, how, how much force you put into it, and also the color of your sound that really changes. So if if you didn't make the dynamic, uh, you are probably in trouble. I can make you sound loud, but you're still gonna sound piano if you didn't do it. Great, any other questions? So we basically have to all be ninjas. Let's just take Brendan's advice. Chamber musician is like being a ninja. We have to be mind readers. We have to know how to lead. We have to know how to follow. Um, and you just have to be really smart. You have to be really smart because it's just, it's a, it's a pretty intense activity. You're listening, you're reading, you're playing, um, and you're putting all these small jobs that everybody had to bring to the table and you're making a, a, a you know, music out of that. It's not just you trying to figure it out. And always keep in mind that you're not gonna solve everything. I think that's another one important thing that I've learned is that when you hear a problem, if you're an active person, like you know most of us are, you think, oh, I can fix that. Let me let me play it a little bit louder and make the sound better. Or like, oh, I can fix this pulse. Let me just play it faster. It doesn't work that way with chamber music. You know, you have to communicate. You're not the solution of four different people's heart and brain. So that's the importance of rehearsal. You, you talk about it, you discuss it, and you play it together. And um, one of my <laughs> mentors and teachers once told me, he's like, if you say something in rehearsal and your partners don't respond to it, say it one more time. And if it didn't work again, you're the problem. You know, we all, it's really easy to think, oh man, that violinist didn't, you know, respond to what I said. Oh, the cellist gave like a too, too big of a beat. You know, it's always so much easy to think that like you could have fixed it, but people didn't. But it's really important to know that it's never one thing. Yeah, so that that kind of open mindedness will help this whole chamber music experience a lot easier and more effective for you to be able to listen. Um, OK, well, thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, a lot of you are doing a really good job in this really unusual but exciting way of doing chamber music um, and you know we have three more days and I'm really excited to see where this goes so keep up the good work and if you are listening to uh, our YouTube thanks for listening thanks for tuning in we have three more lectures tomorrow Brendan's gonna be talking about intonation uh, oh two more lectures I'm sorry Brendan will be talking about intonation and then the last lecture will be by Avery on being creative and being awesome so thanks, everybody. I'll see you guys all tomorrow at the same time.